with prayer. Lord, we thank you, we bless you, we praise you, we magnify you. Uh, that things are as well as they are. Because in each and every situation we've already discussed, Lord, things could always be worse. Uh, we could be outside in the cold. We could be on our uh, a deathbed of a future. We could be hurting in, and not being able to express our pain. We, there, there are just a variety of things that could be worse in every situation. We could be without food. We could be without shelter. But you and your infinite wisdom, Lord, have provided uh, what we need and how we need it. And for that, we're just thankful. Lord, I bless you, praise you, and magnify you for each person that's on this call. I ask your continued blessings and protection over each and every one of them, Lord. Blessing their households, their families, their neighborhoods. Lord, you kept each and every one of us safe through the year. And for that, we're thankful. Uh, you, you kept us in spite of sometimes our own selves, Lord. Because many times, Lord, we get in our own way. While you're trying to do one thing, we're busy trying to undo it. So... Lord, just continue to work with us. And for this lesson today, Lord, I ask that you open up our minds, open up our hearts, that we may be receptive to what you would have us to learn, and that ultimately you get the praise, glory, and honor that you were due as a result of us sharing this lesson with others. We love you, bless you, praise you, and magnify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Alrighty, we are looking at the series, Who is Jesus? And today we are looking at Jesus, who is God's final word. Imagine that there is a board meeting in heaven, and the archangel Michael says, I call this meeting to order. The commander of the armies of the Lord taps the gavel, and the rest of the angels become quiet and look at their leader to start the meeting. This was an important meeting because God, the ultimate chairman of the universe, the creator of all things, was revealing his plan to the angels. It was a plan to fix humanity and pay for sin. I have words in my hand from the skull, scroll from God Almighty. The title of the scroll is Heaven Goes to Earth. Immediately the angels began to talk amongst themselves. Who's leaving heaven to go to earth? Who are we going to send? Uh, what would be required of the one to go? Who did God pick? All of the questions and a few more were flying around the table as the angels talked among themselves. Again, Michael says, I call this meeting to order. The rest of the angels became quiet. And he responded, it is not any of us. None of us are going to earth. All eyes began to look large questions. He said, Gabriel said, good. I've been down there giving messages, and heaven is where I want to be. Who is he, our God, great God Almighty? Who is he going to send? One of the angels looked back and questioned from the back of the room. Michael looked at his fellow angels with a long gaze. He looked at the scroll in front of him. He began to read the scroll that had been provided from him. The Lord God Almighty wishes to inform his angels that the time has come for his will and plan to save humanity to move forward in a significant matter. Heaven will be going to earth. I am sending, Michael paused, and he could hardly read the rest of the words. The rest of the angels leaned forward in their chairs. 
Who is he? Our God, great God Almighty going to sin? All the angels in the room question. Michael looked forward, leaned forward, and read, The Lord God Almighty says, I am sending... I'm sending myself. And as we take a look at our passage for today, it says we look at this sun and we see God who cannot be seen. We look at this sun and we see God's original purpose in everything. For everything, absolutely everything, above and below, visible and visible, rank after rank after rank of angels, everything got started in him and finds its purpose in him. He was there before any of it came into existence, and he holds it all together right up to this very moment. And when it comes to the church, he organizes and holds it together like a head does a body. He was supreme in the beginning and leading the resurrection parade. He is supreme in the end. From beginning to end, he's there, towering above everyone and everything. So, who is he sending? What is the final word that God is sending? God's final word is Jesus. So after taking a look at our lesson today, we'll know that Jesus was fully God and fully man in one person, and will be so forever. He was both human and divine, and we'll understand why and how he is the Word of God. In fact, he's God's last word. In knowing and understanding that, we'll realize the real meaning of of Christmas was not the beginning of Jesus' life. That's far too late. In fact, at Christmas, God is introducing himself by saying, Hello, my name is Jesus. Many of our stories, of the story of Jesus, begin too late. When speaking of his beginning, many of us talk about Bethlehem and the the star-filled night when Christ was born of a Virgin Mary in the smelly Middle Eastern stable where there was no room for him in the inn. Then we proceed to tell of his life, his death, his resurrection, and the promise of his return to take us home to heaven with him. But in these words of Paul in Colossians that I just read, we find one of the most incredible statements in all the Bible. Christ is the invisible image of the vis it, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation, for through him God created everything. So this goes back before Bethlehem. This goes back before the creation, back to the counsels of God before time began. Remember Jesus split B.C. and A.D.? Uh, split time into B.C. and A.D. And Paul spoke about Jesus not only as the image of the invisible God, but he said, by him all things were created. So he is before all things. Jesus didn't just appear on the scene in Bethlehem. He was there all along. When we read that initial verse, it doesn't say in the beginning God created Jesus. In Genesis 1 and 1, it reads in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. We find everything there. We shouldn't think just in terms of Genesis 1 and 1 as being the creation of everything. It wasn't. John tells us, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word is Jesus, God's final Word. So, how many of you mothers, <coughs> excuse me, uh, when your darling children 
were getting on your nerves asking you questions, gave that lovely statement that this is my final word. Because the next time that you were going to respond, you were going to respond in an unusual kind of way that was going to be heard throughout the the household. Well, that final answer for us is Jesus. If you reject Jesus and all that he offers, you know, the Holy Spirit, the call, redemption, Emmanuel, salvation, thanksgiving, uh, merriment, adoption, and strength, you know, from last week that we talked about, all those gifts that he offers, if you reject that, guess what? It's still being offered. It doesn't matter if you reject it or not, he is still offering himself. We never want to be left without a word from those we love. Today is the birthday of my oldest sister. And oh, how I would love, if nothing else, to hear from her. But it's even better to know that God has never left his people without a word. He has always spoken to his people. God always has some communication going on. When Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, God spoke to them. He would fellowship with them in person. He walked with them. He talked with them. He gave them direct instruction. But that didn't last long. We already know that the fellowship was broken by Adam and Eve's sin. They were cast out of the garden. God spoke to them outside of the garden. But it would never be the same. It would never be. It would not be enough. God didn't stop speaking to them as, you know, sometimes when we stop speaking to folk, we we don't talk to them anymore. Uh, But God didn't do that. So, let's skip ahead in time to the time that the Hebrews were slaves. For over 400 years, they were slaves in Egypt. God heard their cries for mercy. He spoke to Moses, and Moses led them out of bondage. Uh, Moses gave them the law, but that wouldn't be enough. So, many years later, through many captives, remember in Babylonia and many other times, after many years, God heard their cries and led them back to the promised land. In the midst of all this, he was Still speaking before, during, and after. He sent his prophets. He sent Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Hosea, Daniel, Ezekiel, and others. Men called of God, spoken to by God, relaying the message of God to God's people. The Israelites were never left without a word from God. But it wouldn't be enough. God spoke. He never said all that he needed to say. There was something lacking. So we continue to lack something until God spoke his final word. And in his final word, we're going to take a look at from Hebrews chapter 1. It says, going through a long line of prophets, God has been addressing our ancestors in different ways for centuries. Recently, he spoke to us directly through his son. By his son, God created the word in the beginning. And it was all, it will all belong to the son in the end. The son perfectly mirrors God and is stamped with God's nature. He holds Everything together by what he says. That's some powerful words. After he finished the sacrifice for sins, 
The Son took his honored place high in the heavens, right alongside God, far higher than any angel in rank and rule. So the writer of Hebrews declared that God spoke in the past, various times in various ways, but beginning with Adam, God spoke to us in various times throughout the recorded recorded scripture. In fact, in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, he says, I'm declaring war between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He'll wound your head, you'll wound his heel. That was the message to Adam, revealing that Christ was coming to crush the serpent's head. Then he spoke again to Abraham. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 2 and 3, where he says, I'll make you a great nation and bless you. I'll make you famous. You'll be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you. I'll curse those who curse you. All the families of the earth will be blessed through you. He also spoke to Jacob in Genesis 49 and 10, where he says, Judah will hold the royal scepter, and his descendants will always rule. Nations will bring tribute to him and bow in obedience before him. He was revealing to Jacob that the Christ would come through the line of Judah. In Micah, to Micah, God revealed that Christ would be born in Bethlehem. Micah chapter 5 and verse 2 says, But you, Bethlehem, God's country, the run of the litter, from you will come the leader who will shepherd rule Israel. He'll be no upstart, no pretender. His family tree is ancient and distinguished. To Zechariah and Zechariah 11, 12 through 13, God revealed Christ would be betrayed for, for 30 pieces of silver. Verse 12 says, Then I addressed him, Pay me what you think I'm worth. They paid me an insulting sum, counting out 30 silver coins. God told me, Throw it in the poor box. This stingy wage was all they thought of me and my work. So I took the 30 silver coins and threw them into the poor box in God's temple. God spoke to Isaiah in Isaiah 53 and and says but it was our sins that did that to him that ripped and tore and crushed him our sins he took the punishment and made us whole through his bruises were healed and then to David he spoke that God would that he revealed that Christ would be crucified and pierced but would rise again. And we see that in Psalm 22. God also spoke not only at various times, but in various ways. Uh, In Exodus chapter 3, he spoke through a burning bush on Mount Horeb. In Exodus 19 and 16, he spoke through the thunder and lightning at Mount Sinai. In 1 Kings 19, he spoke to Elijah to a still small voice. To Ezekiel, he spoke through a vision. To Daniel, he spoke through dreams. To Balaam, he spoke through a donkey. He's still speaking to some donkeys today. Uh, every time you see a politician's mouth moving, there, he he still might be speaking. To Jacob, God spoke. Through an angel in Genesis chapter 32. Yes, God at various times in various ways spoke to us in times past, but this is in this dispensation of grace that we live, He has spoken to us by His Son. And His Son, Jesus, is the final word. In Colossians, we see all those things, Colossians 2.17, all those things were mere shadows, 
cast before what was to come. The substance is Christ. So, we see Jesus from the shadow to the substance. Um, Paul tells the church of Colossae in verse 6, uh, chapter 2, My counsel for you is simple and straightforward. Go, Just go ahead with what you've been given. You've been given Christ Jesus, the Master. Now live in him. You, you're deeply rooted in him. You're well constructed upon him. You know your way through the faith. Now go do what you've been taught. School's out. Quit studying the subject and start living it. And let your living spill over into thanksgiving. Watch out for people who try to dazzle you with big words and intellectual double talk. They want to drag you off into some endless arguments that never amount to anything. They spread their ideas through the empty traditions of human beings and the empty superstitions of spirit beings. But that's not the way of Christ. Everything of God gets expressed in him. <coughs> so you can see and hear him clearly. You don't need a telescope. You don't need a microscope. Our horoscope to realize the fullness of Christ and the emptiness of the universe without him. When you come to him, that fullness comes together in, for you. His power expands over everything. Everything into this fullness is not something you figure out or achieve. It's not a matter of being circumcised or keeping a long list of laws, because you know they had over 633 laws. No, you're already in, insiders. Not through some secretive initiation rite, but rather through Christ, what Christ has already done, he's already gone through for you, destroying the power of sin. If that's an initiation ritual you're after, You've already been through it by submitting to baptism. Going under the water was the burial of your old life. Coming up out of it was the resurrection. Hallelujah. God raising you from the dead as he did Christ. So when you're stuck in this old, dead, sin-dead life, you were incapable of responding to God. When God brought you alive right along with Christ, think of it. All your sins forgiven. The slate wiped cream, clean. The old arrest warrant canceled and nailed to Christ's cross. He stripped all of the spiritual tyrants in the universe of their sham authority of the cross and marched them naked through the streets. So don't put up with anything pressuring you into details of diet, worship services, or holy days. All of those things are mere shadows cast before what was to come. And that substance is Christ. So, the Old Testament is a book of shadows depic depicting uh, images of our Redeemer, coming Redeemer. But Paul says there are things that are, that this is the uh, a shadow of things to come. Now, to produce a shadow, two things have to come to pass. To produce a shadow, there needs to be both light and an image. Behind the words of the scripture, there is a great light shining through the image of Christ. And it's casting the shadow across its pages. Jesus can be found in every book of the Bible. His shadow is cast across all of the pages. The clarity of the shadow depends on the angle. Early in the morning, when the sun is rising, if you stand in the sunlight, your shadow is completely out of proportion. Uh, if you're short, you're really tall. If you're tall, you're so gigantic, it's, it's crazy. 
However, as the sun continues to rise, the shorter and more revealing the shadow becomes. As soon as it comes, we become more revealing. At mid-morning, when the sun is at a 45-degree angle, the shadow becomes the perfect shape of the body. And when the sun reaches its zenith at high noon, the shadow disappears and the body is seen as it, as it actually is. In other words, there comes a time when you don't see your shadow. So, it is the revelation of Christ in the Bible. When the sun of revelation begins to shine way back in the early chapters of Genesis, the shadow is dim and a bit faint. And remember God says in Genesis 3.15, that, that's where that sun begins to rise. The shadow is out of proportion and it's dim and faint. As the chapters unfold and more light appears, Christ becomes sharper. The focus becomes sharper. By the end of Isaiah chapter 53, uh, down to verse 4, the fact is, it was our pains, our disfigurement, all the things wrong with us, we thought he brought it on himself, that God was punishing him for our own failures, but it was our sins that did that to him that ripped and tore and crushed him, our sins. He took the punishment that made us whole. Through his bruises we get healed. We're all like sheep who wandered off and gotten lost. We've all done our own thing, gone our own way, and God has piled all our sins, everything we've done wrong on him. He was beaten, he was tortured, but he didn't say a word. Like a lamb taken to be slaughtered, and like a sheep being sheared, he took it all in silence. And then when we turn the page at Micah chapter 4, chapter 4, <coughs> starting at verse 4, it says, Remember and keep the revelation I gave through my servant Moses, the revelation I commanded at Horb for all Israel, all the rules and the procedures for right living. But also look ahead. I'm sending Elijah the prophet to clear the way for the big day of Daniel. I mean, the big day of God. The decisive judgment day. He will convince parents to look after their children and children to look up to their parents. If they refuse, I'll come and put land under a curse. That closes out the Old Testament. Then we get to the New Testament in Matthew chapter 1 and 1. And we see the family tree of Jesus Christ, David's son, Abraham's son. It's high noon, and God's clock in the shadow disappears, and we see Jesus. If you don't see him, eh, could be because you don't want to. No more shadows of him, no more types of him, no more prophecies about his coming. Come, Lord Jesus, is in Revelation, and that end of the prophecies. So, just as Jesus' word is the final word of all things on this, the Apostle John said, the word was first, John 1 and 1. The word present to God. God present to the word. The word was God. In readiness for God from day one. Everything was created through him. Nothing, not one thing, came into being without him. He came into existence. What came into existence was life. And the life was light to live by. Then verse 14 says, The word became flesh and moved in flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. We saw the glory with our own eyes, the one-of-a-kind glory, like father, like son, generous inside and out, true from start to finish. So, Jesus was God's incarnated one. The incarnation is the most precious display of divine love to be found anywhere at any time. The incarnation 
It is the Christian belief that God took human form, becoming Jesus. Jesus forsook his throne, being with the angels and the, the elders, to come to us. Incarnation literally means to take on flesh. For Christians, the incarnation shows that Jesus was fully God and fully human. The word incarnate comes from the Latin, which means in the flesh. In, of course, means in, and carnus means flesh. God sent his final word to us, and the final word is Jesus. Has a, it has a name. He has a name. What Jesus said to us is in the Gospels, he's no addendum, no addition. It's final. He's one of us. So in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, we see Jesus is the superior one. As I've already read, going through the line of prophets, God has been addressing our ancestors in different ways for centuries. Recently, he spoke to us through his son. By his son, God created the world in the beginning, and it will all belong to the son in the end. The son directly mirrors God and is stamped with God's nature. He holds everything together by what he says, powerful words. After he finished the sacrifice for sins, the son took his honored place, high place, in the heavens, right alongside God, far higher than any angels in rank and rule. So, God superior one, he is superior in communication. He's communicated to us uh, in a couple of ways. First of which is through creation, through natural revelation. Romans 1, 18 through 20. But God's angry displeasure erupts as acts of human mistrust and wrongdoing and lying accumulate as people try to put a shroud over truth. But the basic reality of God is plain enough. Open your eyes is there. By taking a long and thoughtful look at what God has created, people always have been able to see what their eyes can't see, such as eternal power, for instance, the mystery of his design being. So nobody has a good excuse. We have no excuse because God has revealed himself through nature. Then we see in Psalm 19, starting at verse 1, uh, God's glory is on tour through the skies. God crafted an exhibit, exhibit across the horizon. Madam Day holds classes by every morning. Professor Knight Lectures every evening. Their words aren't heard. Their voices aren't recorded. But their silence fills the earth. Unspoken truth is spoken everywhere. God makes a huge dome for the sun. A super dome. So, his word is spoken through creation. His word is spoken through the conscious. Romans 2, 14, 15, 14 through 16 says, When outsiders who have never heard of God's law follow it more or less by instinct, they confirm its truth by their observe, obedience. They show that God's law is not something alien imposed on us without form, from without, but woven into the very fabric of our creation. There is something deep within them that echoes God's yes and no, right and wrong. Their response to God's yes and no will become public. 
knowledge of the day, God makes his final decision about every man and woman. The message from God that I proclaim through Christ Jesus takes into account all these differences. So that level of conscience shows that God's law is not something weird. It's not something in thrust upon us. It's something that's inside of every one of us that you shouldn't kill, you shouldn't steal. There, there's just something on the inside. Then, it's spoken to us through the preachers. Because Hebrews 1 and 1, in the past God spoke through the prophets on our ancestors in many times and ways. Without God's mouthpiece, our finite minds can't figure it out. He also speaks to us through Christ, through special revelation. Uh, Hebrews 1 and 2 says, In these final days, though he spoke to us through his son, his son made his son the heir of everything and created the world through him. Others don't know. When we come to Christ, he just reveals himself more and more and more. And in verse 4, it says, And the Son came so much greater than the other messengers, such as angels, that he received a more important title than theirs. <coughs> Excuse me. So, we see he is the superior one in communication. He's also the superior one in creation. John 1 and 3. Everything was created through him. Nothing, not one thing, nada, came into existence without him. And in Colossians 1 and 16, for everything, absolutely everything above and below, visible and invisible, rank after rank after rank of angels, everything got started in him and finds its purpose in him. So, it started in communication, in creation, and in continuation. Because we see in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, in the Amplified Bible, the sun is the radiance and the only expression of the glory of our awesome God, reflecting God's Shekinah glory, the light beam, the brilliant light of the divine, and the exact representation and perfect imprint of his Father's existence, and upholding and maintaining the proper, the, sorry, the propelling all things, and maintaining and propelling all things, the entire physical <laughs> and spiritual universe, by his powerful word, carrying the universe along to its predestined goal, predetermined goal. When he himself and no other had, by offering himself on the cross as a sacrifice for sin, accomplished purification from sin, and established our freedom from guilt, he sat down, revealing his completed work, as he shouted out on the cross, it's finished, at the right hand of the majesty of on high, revealing his divine authority. Uh, remember he asked, where is the snow? Where did the mountain goat give birth this morning? The only one that knows that is Jesus. So now we see that Jesus is the selected one. Hebrews chapter 1. <coughs> Excuse me, starting at verse 4. He is far higher than any angel in rank and rule. Did God ever say to the angel, you're my son. Today I celebrate you, or I'm his father, he's my son. Verse 6, when he presents his honored son to the world, 
<coughs> Excuse me. He says angels must worship him. Regarding angels, he says the messengers are winds. The servants are tongues of fire. But he says to the Son, you're God. And on the throne for good, your rule makes everything right. You love it when things are right. You hate it when things are wrong. That's why God, your God, poured fragrant oil on your head, marking you out as king far above your dear companions. And then we saw there again in Colossians 1, 15 through 17, we've seen he's the shadow Jesus, uh, from shadow to substance, the superior one, and now we see he's the believer selected one. Because of his person, he is the image of the invisible God. We see Jesus, we say hello to God. He doesn't look like God, he is God. Christmas is God saying, hello. I'm God, but you can't. You can call me Jesus. Uh, there are many of many ways in which my nephews. I can always tell which one of my nephews and their friends uh, by what they call me. I have one nephew that calls me Unc. One that calls me old unk, one calls me Uncle David, uh, 50 some odd years old still. And their friends likewise call me, so I can always tell uh, who's calling. Here's that great part about God. Uh, regardless of which name has been ascribed to him, you can always count on his call. He is God's icon, exactly like God. So he's the selected one because of his person, because of his power, because of his permanence. He ain't going to know where y'all. Hebrews 1, 10 through 12. You again to the Son. You, Master, started it all. Laid earth's foundations, then crafted the stars in the sky. Earth and sky will wear out, but not you. They become threadbare like an old coat. You'll fold them up like a worn-out cloak and lay them away on the shelf, but you'll stay the same year after year. You'll never fade. You'll never wear out. Here's that craziest part of all is many times, throughout many ways, we have missed him. Poem says, they were looking for a lion, he came as a lamb. They missed him. They were looking for a warrior, he came as a peacemaker. They missed him. They were looking for a king, he came as a servant. They missed him. They were looking for liberation from Rome. He submitted to the Roman stake. They missed him. They were looking for him to fit into their mold. He was a mold maker and they missed him. They were looking for temporal needs to be met. Remember when he fed the 5,000? But he came to meet their internal need, and they missed him. Today, today, if you don't know why Christ came, he came as a lamb to be sacrificed for your sin, so you will not miss him. He came to make peace between God and humanity, so you won't miss him. He came to model servanthood for all humanity so that you won't miss him. He came that we might have true liberty so that we can't miss him. So, in your life and in my life, 
Jesus knows best. Best. He is ultimately involved with both heaven and earth. He is God's final answer. If you want to get from one spot to another, if you want to be who God desires you to be, then you need to trust him to be the selected one. Because he is God's final answer. So, now it's time for me to hear from you. Who have you found him to be? I have found him to be a healer. Star six, what say you? What have you found Jesus to be? He is God's final word. So what have you found him to be? He's my life? everything, and he's my right. anything. <coughs> Whatever I All need, right. whenever I need it. That's All what right. he is. I can't name one thing because he's <coughs> everything I need. All righty. A deliverer. He has saved me from countless circumstances. All righty. Anybody else? So nobody's found him to be a lawyer. Nobody's found him to be that mother for you. Yeah. When your mother's gone. What's and that my best sibling. All right. <laughs> yes, ma'am. He's my up when I'm down. All righty. Anybody else? He's a he's a provider. All righty. My keeper. Yes, ma'am. Anybody he's else? He's my consoler. He's All my righty. And he's my comforter. He helps to wipe my tears away. Yes, ma'am. Anybody else? My judge and my lawyer. All righty. <laughs> okay. Well, from the final word, and the hope that he brings. Explain your experience of how Christ started illuminating things in your life that needed clarification or clearance with the doubters that you meet, because you're always going to meet a doubter. Share with some and remind others about the person, the power, the permanence, and the preeminence of Christ in your life. Your giving should be a reflection of how good you have been blessed. And never doubt your worth because of what Christ has done in your life. 
especially since we are all great cases. Well, I pray something has been said, something has been, so you've heard something, you've read something through God's final word that has brought about a change so that you can boldly share where others will fall short so that God ultimately will get the glory that he is due especially from you sharing him with others. I look forward to hearing from you next year and look forward to hearing from you and uh, praying that all goes well. Father, we come to you as only we can. You are our final word. You have given us our final word. That final word is glorious. That final word is wonderful. That final word is love. That final word is peace. That final word is joy. Lord, I thank you for all the many ways that you've kept us. You've kept us through this year. Many of us have been sick. Not once, not twice, but many times. But just the same, you kept us. Many of us have been down and out. Not once, not twice, but many times. And you kept us. So for that, Lord, I, I just say thank you. Many of us have sometimes not given you the thought that we need to give you. Lord, continue to work with us. Continue to infuse more of you through us so that we can ultimately make you proud, so that we can ultimately, through our lives, give you the glory that you are due. Lord, you're such an awesome God. <coughs> you're such a never-failing God. We can't make it without you, God. Lord, I praise you. For all the many things that have gone on this year, some things that we enjoyed, some things we found painful, some things we didn't even know were happening, but just the same, you, you protected us, you provided for us, you've just been that awesome friend, you've been that awesome God that you are. Lord, there are some that have experienced uh, tragedy as of late, uh, damage to their homes, damages to their um, facilities. But God, you've kept them. They may not have been as warm as they would have liked to have been. They might have had a few things destroyed by water or or other types of damage, Lord, but just the same, you've kept them. You made a way in the past. All we got to do is think about how you're going to make a way in the future, Lord. And we should be able to give you the praise that you were due. Lord, now as we gather to do those things you could have us to do for another year. I ask that you continue to keep your arms of protection around us. Uh, continue to infuse more of you through us so that we can represent you well, so that we can share you well, so that others come to know you well, so that others come to know you, period. Lord, you're an awesome God. You're our mighty God. And we can't make it without you. These things we ask in your mighty and majestic Son's name. Amen. <laughs>